Okay, so for the last talk of this session, we have Ann Kennedy presenting Social Behavior Shapes Hypothalamic Neural Ensemble Representations of Conspecific Sex. Ann? All right, thanks. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna be talking about representations of social interactions in, well, does this? Okay, in animals that are freely interacting with male and female conspecifics as we're using this microendoscope that you guys have heard a lot about to look at neural representations in hypothalamus. So the Anderson Lab at Caltech is in general interested in what's going on in the brains of animals as they're act interacting with the world or with conspecifics. And you can think of this traditionally as like this very robotic, you, know, you get a sensory input, you perform some sort of action selection, and then you execute a behavior based on your decision-making process. But what's interesting about this process for, uh, for survival behaviors is that it's very flexible and it depends a lot on the animal's internal state. So changes like establishing dominance in a, in a colony of animals or forming memories of individuals or things like stress or hunger or fear will change the animal's decision of how it's going to map a given sensory situation to an execution of a behavior. Now the Anderson Lab is interested in addressing this question in the hypothalamus, which doesn't get a lot of showtime at Cosine, uh, this is a midbrain or a deep brain structure um, composed of a series of nuclei that's involved in a lot of innate survival behaviors. Uh, so hypothalamus and then its inputs in the amygdala and BNST get input from a wide variety of sensory areas, sensory cortices, and from the hippocampus. And it sends projections mostly to the periaqueductal gray, which you heard Tiago Branco talk about last night. And so PAG contains a lot of motor populations for all sorts of specific behaviors like escape or biting or freezing. And what's going on in the hypothalamus, we think, is some sort of decision-making process where the animal takes a bunch of sensory inputs and determines, preferentially biases, different PAG populations towards being activated. Now, historical studies have identified, um, well, basically, hypothalamus is made up of a, a whole bunch of nuclei that are densely interconnected with each other and very gene genetically heterogeneous. Uh, so there are nuclei like MPO, VMHBL, PMB, that are implicated in various innate, sort of instinctive, reproductive, and defensive, and feeding behaviors. And historically, a bunch of studies have found that if you lesion or stimulate these areas, you can find um, relationships between certain hypothalamic nuclei and behavioral drives such as thirst or hunger or fear or aggression or reproduction. Now the Anderson Lab has for a while been very interested in one of these nuclei, the ventrovial portion of the ventromedial hypothalamus, or VMHBL, which we found in a series of previous studies was involved in aggressive behavior. Uh, so longtime cosine attendees might remember David Anderson giving a talk a couple years ago where he showed that if you activate neurons in the VMHBL, you get a time-locked attack towards conspecifics and if you inhibit these neurons, you can interrupt attack. And this is very specific to VMHBL. If you activate neighboring regions like DM, you instead get fear responses. MPO, you get mating responses. So there's something about these neurons that seems important for this innate territory defending aggressive behavior. So um, the data I'm going to be talking about was collected by Ryan Remedios, who's a postdoc in the Anderson Lab and he performed microendoscopic imaging in VMHBL to ask what goes on in VMHBL during naturally occurring behavior. So he implanted these mice with a grin lens and a microendoscope to image G-camp fluorescence, and then he just looked at two-minute social interactions with a conspecific. So he takes the animal in its home cage, puts a male or a female in the cage with it, and lets them just interact for two minutes. He did about 10 of these trials a day for three consecutive days of imaging and we wanted to see what, what came out of this data. Um, so I'll start with the, the dominant representation in the animals at the end of the study. So if you look at the neural re responses on day three, you see this very strong representation of the sex of the intruder. So on female trials, you see a population of neurons that are responsive repeatedly in the presence of females, and there's a second population population of neurons that is repeatedly active in the presence of males. Uh, this representation of intruder sex was responsible for a large proportion of the variance in the imaged neurons. Although I should say, um, 
uh, in the interest of time, I let this out, but we can also decode a lot of the animal's specific behaviors from the activity of VMHVL neurons. So we can predict when the animal is going to attack or sniff or mount based on the, the activity of these cells. Um, the reason I'm leaving this out, though, is because of some interesting findings that we had with this representation of the intruder sex. So you can see here that male and female representations are very dissimilar, and we wanted to come up with a way to put a number to this. And we looked at a couple methods in the paper, but the most simple of them is to just take the average response of VMHVL neurons to a male, the average response to a female, either during all periods of social interaction or say only during sniffing or only when the intruder's introduced or only when the animals are together but not interacting. The results are kind of the same regardless of the criterion you use. And then we just looked at the Pearson's correlation between male and female representations or between male representations on one trial and the trial average. So here this is, uh, each point is a trial on day three for comparing a male to the average male response, a female to the average female response in red, or male to female and female to male in green. So you can see unsurprisingly that the male and female representations are very uncorrelated. What was surprising in this study though is that when we looked at activity across all three days of the experiment, we saw a change in this representation. So on day three, we have these nice decorrelated representations of males and females. But when we look at the same thing on day two and on day one, we see that there's a very different representation of intruder sex on the first day of the experiment. Um, you can see this in a lot of other metrics for entrance. If you, for instance, if you just look at the fraction of cells responding to males and females, you see a lot more cells on the first day that respond to both males and females compared to on the third day. So we found this really weird, unexpected effect where neurons responded mostly to both males and females on the first day of the experiment, but by the third day we had two largely non-overlapping populations, which led us to ask um, what drives this separation of representations and can we say anything about what this separation means in terms of VMHVL's role in social behavior? So, a clue to answering this question came from looking at trials from the individual mice. So what I'm plotting here is for each trial, the Pearson's correlation between the intruder sex on that trial and the intruder sex, and the opposite sex intruder representation on the trials that immediately preceded or followed it. So this is male-female representation as a moving representation over time. And you can see that mice form these separate representations at different rates. You have mice that separate very quickly and stay separated, mice that separate more slowly, and then mice that just don't really separate at all. And what was interesting is we went back and looked at what was going on in the behavior of these mice. And the mice that didn't separate at all still interacted with male and female conspecifics, but their interactions were very different. They mostly showed on the third day uh, a lot of sniffing towards males and females, but, the mice, but they didn't show any of the attack or mounting that the mice with well-separated representations showed. So we decided to take this um, measure of male-female representation separation and regress it a bunch, against a bunch of different measures of the animal's behavior. And what we found is that while the cumulative time the animal had spent interacting with conspecifics wasn't a good representation of separation, if we plotted the, cumul the separation against, oops, the cumulative time the animal spends mounting and antigenital sniffing, which is like a predecessor behavior to mounting, then you find this very clear correlation between how separated the representations are and the animal's cumulative experience. Interestingly, even though VMHVL is an area that's involved in attack, we didn't see that attack was predictive of separation. In fact, um, we didn't tend to see attack happening until the representations were already separated. So it seems like we have this interesting sequence of, ev of events where the animal gains sexual experience in uh, mounting females, there's a representation separation in VMHVL, and then there's an increase in male-directed aggression. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting effect. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about one experiment we did um, following up on this to sort of draw, st to strengthen this correlational observation. So another postdoc in the lab, Moriel Zolikowski, did a behavioral experiment in mice that weren't implanted with miniscopes, where she took a, a, a male mice in its home cage, and she either introduced another male 
or she gave the animal 30 minutes of sexual experience and then introduced a male 24 hours later. The mice that just saw the male showed no attack towards that male, but the mice that had had sex the day before showed pronounced male-directed aggression. We wanted to see if this hap what was happening in VMHVL representations during this task. So we did the same thing with implanted mice. We took uh, an implanted animal, gave it a single trial of free interactions for 30 minutes with a male or a female conspecific, and then a day later gave it interactions with the conspecific of the other sex. And to get the representations of males and females, we did these brief 10 second probe trials where we just dangled in a mouse and removed it and didn't give the animals time to interact. We know from another experiment that this restricted access is not sufficient to learn representations of intruder sex. So it works as just sort of a probe of how VMHVL represents intruders without giving them experience that changes that representation. So like in the unimplanted mice, we see that the animals that were presented with a male on day one showed no attack. The animals that saw a female on day one and a male on day two showed pronounced attack. And then we went in and looked at the VMHVL representations. So this is data from two mice that were implanted with miniscopes. Uh, these mice saw a male on day one and a female on day two. And you can see in the gray bars here that there's pretty much no change in the correlation between male and female representations on the second day of imaging. However, in the mice that saw a female on day one and had time to interact with the female, we see that on day two, even before they've seen the male, there's a drop in the Pearson's correlation between the male and female representations. So this 30 minutes of experience without ever having an encounter with males afterwards is sufficient to drive uh, a separation in male and female representations. So just to sum up, um, we have overlapping representations in VMHVL. We think sexual experience drives some sort of reward signal that drives some sort of learning or plasticity either in VMHVL or possibly upstream or throughout hypothalamus that leads to a separation of representations in VMHVL and also leads to increased male-directed aggression. So that's the, the conclusion from this story, but I think um, this process is not unique to just sexual experience. I think in general it represents something about state changes in the representation in the hypothalamus, which is that large changes of representation in hypothalamus can reflect a change in the animal's motivational state and can underlie a change in the control policy that determines an animal's action by preferentially biasing different motor output regions in PAG to perform different behaviors. And I'm just out of time, so I'm going to thank Ryan Remedios, who did all of the imaging experiments in this study, and Moriel, who helped with the uh, behavior experiments, and all of the members of the Anderson Lab at Caltech. So thank you guys. We have time for one or two questions. My first? Yep. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I was just curious about the behavior that you're studying, and do you think it's, um, is this kind of a permanent switch in the mouse's behavior, or is this like a guarding reflex, trying to protect what it perceives as like its, its uh, yeah. like area? So we went ben back in and looked at representations in these mice two months after right. the initial experiments, and they were still separated. So it seems like it's a permanent switch. Okay. You could imagine that other kinds of changes are more reversible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you measure the decorrelation between male and female? Do you see whether one changes more than the other? Yeah, we tried to look at that. It's, it was kind of different in each animal that we looked at. We couldn't draw a really strong conclusion about how representations are changing. It seems like both male and female representations change. You have a lot of cells that don't respond on the first day that start to respond, and other cells that respond on the first day that turn silent. So it's, it's, it's pretty complicated. Thank you, Anne. Right. Thanks.